Okay, soon we are going to be live, but please start at five at, at, on the hour so that we uh, don't surprise anybody. Okay, we're live. All right, then I will welcome you to the um, last part of these L2021, sadly more virtual than Ljubljana, would have liked to go there again. Um, and it's my great pleasure to um, hey, introduce Linda Westrick um, for this. Um, she has gotten her, her, her PhD from um, Berkeley, working with Ted Slayman um, in a postdoc in Connecticut and in um, Wellington, um, is now a professor in Penn State. And she's been doing all kinds of interesting work in, in sort of area of computability, reverse mass, descriptive set theory, and so on. And her topic today very nicely links these, and she, she's going to tell us how to handle Borel sets in reverse mass. Um, you can all use the chat to ask questions, and you're welcome to ask questions during the talk if you have any, but there will be a, a chance to ask questions afterwards. Let's do. Linda, please go ahead. Thank you, Arno, for the introduction. Since I'm the last speaker in this conference, it's uh, both my honor uh, and my pleasure to uh, invite everybody to actually give a round of applause for the organizers led by Alex Simpson, Crystal Beyer, and John Gabolarek uh, for putting on such a really nice conference. I've really enjoyed the talk so far and it's been an extra challenge to do it online. So uh, with that, I'll, I'll begin now to tell you, as Arno said, about Borel sets in reverse mathematics. And this is a work that I've been involved in for a few years now with many co-authors. And so the, they're listed here, Astor Safarov, Flood, Montalban, Solomon, Tausner, and Weishar. And uh, I'll point out in the talk uh, as well where various results come from. But I'm going to begin with a uh, a, a game that, in order to, to motivate some of these results, I'm going to begin with a, a game that many of you may have seen before. So this game is known as the prisoner hat game. And you imagine that you have six prisoners, and I, I don't know why they're prisoners, but they're, they're in a line and they're all facing the same way and they're all wearing a hat. So each wears a red or a blue hat. And each one can see the hats that are ahead of their own hat. So uh, I've tried to draw here, these, these are the prisoners, right? And this uh, line, these lines here are attempting to indicate what is the field of view that the prisoners have. So the uh, prisoner at the very back of the line can see every hat except for their own hat, but then they see progressively fewer as they go for, forward in the line. All right, so we have these prisoners and they are uh, wearing these hats and seeing only the ones that are ahead of them. And the game is that they each want to try to guess their own hat color. And their goal is to make at most one mistake. Now, nobody can see the hat of the first prisoner. So the, the first prisoner basically uh, might make a mistake. Uh, so, it, so it pretty much means that everybody except the first prisoner has, has to get it right in order for them to win. Uh, and, so it's, and so it's kind of a puzzle, can they do it? Now it happens that they can, but I, for, for the material that I'm gonna cover in this talk, uh, I actually don't need anything about the explicit strategy. So I decided actually that in case you have not seen this lovely puzzle before, uh, that I won't spoil it for you. And uh, so we'll just say that there, there is a way, uh, they're allowed to agree on a strategy beforehand and agreeing on such a strategy beforehand, there is a way for them to, to succeed in this game. 
there's a generalization of the prisoner hat game, which may be a little bit less known, known as the infinite prisoner hat game. And it's exactly the same game, but the only difference is that now the line of prisoners is infinite. Perhaps surprisingly, the prisoners are still able to win this game. It's possible for them to agree on a strategy beforehand, such that if they all follow this strategy, then they will make at most one mistake. What kind of strategy could this possibly be? Again, because it's a great puzzle and I don't want to spoil it, I won't tell you, but they, they use the axiom of choice uh, to construct this, this strategy. This can feel a little bit unsatisfying perhaps because there, there's a sense in which we know what, what, what the strategy is uh, after, you know, if, 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 you would, if you would see this construction, which I don't show you, but uh, there's a sense in which we know what the strategy is, but there's also a sense in which we don't. So we may be interested in strategies that we can better understand what the strategy is doing. And in order to talk about that, uh, I am going to get a little bit more formal about what a strategy is for us. So a strategy is going to be some subset of the set of finite strings on guesses red and blue across the set of infinite strings on guesses red and blue. And uh, the strategy here is being called R because these are the circumstances that uh, if a prisoner encounters them, the prisoner is going to guess red. Uh, and then if uh, some circumstance is not in the set, then the prisoner will guess blue on that circumstance. So to follow the strategy, uh, so I've, I've depicted it here from the point of view of the, uh, the third prisoner. So I'm going to start counting prisoners as zero. So from the point of view of the, of the third prisoner, they can't see any hat behind them or their own hat, but they've heard, let's say the guesses are BR. So this is the finite string of heard guesses. And then they are seeing some sequence of hat colors in front of them. So that's this S that they see. And then if this combination sigma S is in the set, then they'll guess red and otherwise they'll guess blue. So every strategy that the players could agree upon beforehand uh, take, takes this form. It's just a rule for telling you what to guess, given what you've heard and what you're seeing. Now let's talk about Borel strategies. We can define first a strategy that seems like it uh, may be a very worthless one, uh, a basic open strategy, which is a set that takes the form so the, it's uh, parameterized by two finite strings of guesses. One is a string of guesses that you've heard. And then the other is a string of guesses where uh, if you look uh, ahead of you and just see that tau is like basically like the first, you know, however many hats that you're seeing happen to be tau, then you're not gonna care about what else you're seeing, right? So this uh, notation means that uh, the uh, string tau is an initial segment of the uh, infinite uh, string s. And so this open strategy right here corresponds to the idea that we're going to guess red if we have heard sigma and then the next hats that we see are tau and then we don't look beyond that. And then otherwise we just guess blue. So this strategy is not going to be a very winning one. Um, but we can use it as a building block to make a larger collection of strategies. So the Borel strategies are defined inductively. So the, these basic open strategies and their complements are Borel. Uh, any countable intersection of Borel strategies is also Borel. And any countable union of Borel strategies is also Borel. So we're just uh, taking, taking the union, take, uh, taking these basic open strategies and closing up under countable unions and intersections. You can, you can describe a lot of things in this way. So uh, if, you, if you have seen this, uh, if, if, you've, if you've seen um, uh, the, these kind of uh, constructions before, then you know sort of how expressive they can be. Um, if you haven't seen before intuitively, a Borel strategy is just some strategy that has an explicit definition. So I'll give one example of this. If we let R be the strategy 
obtained by taking the union over anything that you could possibly hear. Of so add add R to that. So that means anything you could hear and then, but like the last thing that you heard was R. And then here, this lambda is the empty string. So that means uh, don't care even about anything that you see looking ahead of you. If then, then this uh, Borel strategy could be described in English by saying guess R if and only if the prisoner behind you guessed R. Because, and, and if there's no prisoner behind you, then, then you're guessing blue. Uh, but these uh, basic open strategies are just being combined so that if the last thing that you heard was R, that's the only way that you can get into this red guess set. But any strategy that you could come up with that is based on an algorithm or based on some kind of maybe slightly transfinite algorithm where you look at the whole a string and ask, you know, did you see infinitely many occurrences of some kind of, you know, basically any, almost anything that you would describe as, okay, here's my strategy, very likely it would be Burrell. So that's why this is like a large class of uh, potential strategies that we, uh, that we care about. So it's a it's a fact, and I, I think I think it may be a folklore fact that that there's no Burrell winning strategy available to the prisoners, and we can prove that uh, as follows. So I'll sketch sketch the proof for you now. This this is the only proof that is going to appear in the talk. So suppose suppose that we did suppose for contradiction that we did have a Burrell winning strategy. Well. Every Burrell set is measurable. All right, so uh, measurable set is just one that has a well-defined notion of size. Using the axiom of choice, you, you, can, you can make non-measurable sets. Uh, so for example, that's how the von Ocharsky paradox works uh, by, by using the axiom of choice to, to construct some, some very bad non-measurable sets that you can take apart this ball and put it back together into to two identical walls. But, uh, every, but every Borel set is, uh, ha has a well-defined notion of its size. And it turns out, so this is uh, just a fact about measure theory, that uh, measurable sets are kind of clumpy. So whenever you have, have a set that is measurable, you can always, uh, a, 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 as long as you ever guess red, so let's you know, assume that we guess red at least sometimes, uh, at least positive, let's assume that we guess red at least positive measure of the time. If we guess red at least positive measure of the time, then there is always going to be some segment of guesses tau such that if the, such that the prisoner zero, if they start out seeing tau, then 99% of the time, no matter what else they see, they're gonna say red. It's just because the uh, set of strategies is measurable, it's gonna clump around one or other of the colors somewhere. And without loss of generality, let's say it's, it's clumping around red. Well, if prisoner zero is going to guess red 99% uh, of the time upon seeing, uh, upon seeing some hats uh, in front of them that extends tau, then since there are so many possibilities that that the first prisoner would guess red on, there actually has to be sort of one common, common possibility. So starting from tau and then saying that the next prisoner is red, there has to be some infinite sequence of continued hats S prime, such that prisoner zero guesses red on this sequence, but also guesses red on the same sequence, but where uh, blue is the next thing that comes after tau as well. All right, that's just because 99% of the stuff extending tau, prisoner zero is gonna say red about. So uh, you, you, we, we can't have it be that the extensions of tau that begin with red have uh, a sequence of red continuations that's disjoint from the ones that begin with blue. There's, there's just not enough that you're gonna answer blue for. Okay, 
So prisoner zero guesses, guesses red on, on both of these, when, when prisoner zero sees both of these two sequences. All right, so let's make sure that the prisoner zero is wrong on, uh, uh, in, in two situations. So let's define two situations for what the total distribution of colors of the hats could be. So in one case, imagine that all of the hats are the zero, the zero prisoner has a blue hat and then sees this. And then SB is a situation where the zero prisoner has a blue hat and then sees that. The zero prisoner is guessing red, so the zero, prisoner zero is wrong in both of these cases. Then, oh, just said that. So we're assuming, though, that we have a winning strategy here. So what are the next prisoners going to do? Well, prisoners one through tau, because it's a winning strategy, by following the strategy, they, they have to be guessing correctly on SR and SB. So prisoners one through tau just state the uh, guesses that are there in tau. And then what happens when you get to prisoner tau plus one? Well, prisoner tau plus one, here's the first prisoner say blue. Here's the next prisoners state all of the bits of tau. And prisoner tau plus one also just sees this S prime. So that means that on at least one of these two instances, prisoner tau plus one is going to be guessing incorrectly. So that's the proof. And the main sort of uh, non-constructive fact or uh, where the power in this proof came from was knowing that every Borel strategy has a is measurable, and then knowing this, this fact about measurable sets, that they have this clumping property. All right, so, so, so there's a proof. There's actually another proof of this theorem that uses a different method. Uh, so what I have written here is actually so far just a complete copy of the, the proof that I just showed you but uh, I'm going to just change it a little bit in order to make it a different proof using, uh, instead of measure, using bare category. Uh, so bare category is uh, another way. So one way that Borel sets are nice is that they have a well-defined notion of size, they're measurable. Another way that Borel sets are nice is that uh, they have what's called the property of bare. And uh, if you have not seen it before, then don't worry about it. It's just another uh, way to say that a set is well-behaved. So we're going to change this to say, instead of saying R is measurable, R has the property of bare. And then the uh, related kind of clumpiness fact about sets that have the property of bare is that any set that has the property of bare, there's going to be some finite uh, string initial segments such that prisoner zero guesses are not for 99% of the uh, extensions of tau, but for co-meager many of them. Uh, and, and again, if you have not seen bare category before, don't worry about it. Co-meager many just mean, is it just another way to say that basically almost every S uh, extending tau, the prisoner zero is going to guess red. And then, and then from then on, the, the proof is exactly the same. So the question that, uh, that I would like to use to motivate the results in this talk is kind of a philosophical question, which is, are these different proofs or is this the same proof? Now, it's a philosophical question and I am not a philosopher. And I certainly don't claim to, to give an answer to this question, but as a mathematician, something that I like to do is to uh, look at some formalization of this question and then see, see what the answer to some, some formal version of it is. And you could, uh, I'm sure, formalize this question, are the proofs different in many different ways and get all your many different answers and the philosophers could sort out which formalization is best. One perspective that has been taken, and that's the perspective that I'll take here, is, well, what set existence axioms do these proofs use? Maybe if two proofs use two different, two different uh, sets of axioms, then 
that could be one way uh, in which formally they could be considered different. So in order to formalize the question of which axioms are being used in these two proofs, we turn to the system of second order arithmetic. So second order arithmetic is a, a fragment of mathematics in which most ordinary math can actually be carried out. So the only objects in second order arithmetic are natural numbers and subsets of natural numbers. And a subset of natural numbers can be identified with an infinite sequence of bits uh, indi indicating the characteristic function of that subset. So those two are the only kind of objects that are native to second order arithmetic, but every other kind of mathematical object other than some really large uh, sort of set theoretic ones exists through coding. So for example, if we want to talk about Borel sets in the context of second order arithmetic, then we talk about them using a code for how to make the Borel set. And that code takes the form of a well-founded tree that is countably branching and has its nodes labeled with intersections and unions and has its leaves labeled with basic open sets or their complements. So for example, this code that I have here on the left is saying, start with these basic open strategies and then take the, uh, take the intersection of them. And then here you have to imagine there's some other basic open strategies being intersected and over here are some others and so on and so on. Uh, and then taking all of those together, we take their union and so on. So this tree is uh, describing how Borel strategy is being constructed. And then that tree itself can be coded as an infinite sequence of bits. And then it now exists in the universe of second order arithmetic and can be talked about in theorems and so on. The axioms of second order arithmetic, uh, I won't list them out as it would be rather tedious, but they include the axioms of piano arithmetic for the natural numbers. And then there are various set existence axioms saying that certain subsets of the natural numbers that you might describe in various ways actually exist uh, and can be talked about. So, uh, for example, uh, does there uh, exist uh, an oracle for the halting problem? Like in, in mathematics, like is, is that a thing that, that exists? Well, you need an axiom to say that there is such a thing as an oracle that, that, that tells you the, the outcomes of the halting problem. Uh, but there is such an axiom in second order arithmetic. So this is an object that we can't construct, but we can talk about it. And then one axiom of second order arithmetic says that that object exists. So reverse mathematics is a framework for calibrating the strength of various theorems according to the uh, non-constructive uh, differences in the axioms and the set existence axioms that are used in their proofs. So this is a framework that was uh, developed largely, largely by Friedman and Simpson and a quote from Friedman, which I like, uh, when the theorem is proved from the right axioms, the axioms can be proved from the theorem. So suppose that we have some axiom uh, A that's used to prove some theorem T in second order arithmetic. So then the idea behind reverse mathematics to try to, so, so, right, so you might wanna know, well, is there another proof of this theorem T? Did you really need this axiom A in order to prove theorem T or could you have proved theorem T in some other way? So the reverse math approach is that first we fix some base theory, which should just be some small fragment of second order arithmetic, which is strong enough so that the theorem makes sense. Uh, if, if we threw away all the axioms, right, then, <clears throat> then the theorem might uh, just, just look like some garbage, pardon me. But we should fix the base theory so that it is so that it does not include the axiom that we're curious about. Or, and, and, and also doesn't imply it. So now if T and this base theory together imply the axiom, then that means that the axiom is in some sense necessary for proving the theorem. Because 
if the axiom is false, then the theorem is false as well. So this gives, this gives one way of, of giving an affirmative answer to the question, was this axiom needed in order to prove this theorem? Now, the usual base theory that is used in reverse mathematics is uh, known as RCA naught. And this base theory is attractive because it roughly captures constructive mathematics. So the set existence axioms in this usual base theory are just the set existence axioms that essentially say, well, if you could write down an algorithm to tell me what are the bits of some sequence, then that sequence uh, exists in, in this mathematical universe. So going back to our example, here are some, you could either call them theorems or axioms. So in reverse math, the distinction between a theorem and an axiom starts to blur a little bit. Here are the strongest non-constructive theorems slash axioms that are being used in the two proofs that I've shown you today. Every Burrell set is measurable and every Burrell set has the property of bear. These may not immediately look like they are set existence axioms. However, the property of the property of measurability and the property of bear are both properties that are witnessed by some infinite object. So in the case of a, a measurable set, you might have open sets, uh, you know, a sequence, a sequence of open sets that witnesses that the outer measure of the set is something and then another sequence of compact sets coming from the inside to witness that the inner measure of the set is something. And then and you would have a similar uh, witnesses for uh, a Borel set having the property of bear. So th the set existence axiom that is related to the theorem every Borel set is measurable or every Borel set has the property of bear, you are making the claim that these objects that witness these properties exist. All right, so we want to compare these two axioms. And a question that immediately arises is what base theory should be used? In order to address this question, I wanna talk a little bit about Borel set membership. So suppose that we have a Borel set B and then we have some input X and we wanna know whether X is in that Borel set or not. Well, there's a procedure of sorts for figuring this out. And I put procedure uh, in, in very strong air quotes because it's completely non-constructive. But here's the procedure. If you wanna know whether X is in a certain Borel set, you split into two cases based on the, what, what, whatever was the last step in the construction of that Borel set. So if the Borel set you're given is actually just a basic open set or it's complement, then we say, okay, those, those strategies are pretty simple. We can just tell whether or not X is in, uh, in that set or not. If the last thing that we did in the course of building B was to take a countable union, then X is in B, if and only if X is in one of the sets from the union. And if the last thing that we did to construct B was to take a countable intersection, then X is uh, in the set, if and only if it's in all of the sets that we intersected. So notice that in this uh, quote procedure, even, even one step of this procedure is not constructive, all right? If you want to search over all of the sets that have been unioned together, you, 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 may, you may be searching forever and not finding one, but you know, when, when are you gonna know? And that's even assuming that you had some procedure for figuring out whether X was in BN. But of course, this is, uh, this is recursive, right? So now I'm going to be doing the same algorithm again, but now applying it to BN and so on and so on. And this, this uh, algorithm isn't just a recursive algorithm on natural numbers or something like that, the recursion could actually have transfinite depth because the tree structure for the Borel sets uh, could have a quite high ordinal rank. So although it's expressed as, as a procedure, although it is in some sense constructive, uh, it's very far from being uh, possible to carry out in a simple system such as RCA, which only allows us to say that sets exist if there is an actual 
literal computable algorithm for, for computing them. So uh, another axiom that's commonly used in reverse mathematics is the axiom of transfinite recursion. And that axiom, uh, although it's too technical to, to put into this talk, I'll tell you that it roughly states that a procedure such as the above one actually can be carried out. So the set that is being guaranteed to exist is basically the, the set of not only the output, like whether X is in B or not, but sort of the collected summary of all of the facts that you would figure out on the way if you were actually uh, performing this non-constructive algorithm. All right, so arithmetic transfinite recursion. Uh, it's one axiom and it allows us to determine membership in Borel sets. Based on that, it may seem natural that ATR would be a good base theory for theorems involving Borel sets. Because remember for when choosing a base theory, we, we do usually want to choose a base theory that makes the theorem that we are analyzing make sense. So, uh, and, and, and indeed ATR was, was taken uh, as a base theory for, for Borel sets for many years. A problem for the examples that we wanna look at in this talk is ATR is actually already too strong in a way because ATR can already prove that every Borel set is measurable and every Borel set has the property of fair. So the, the proofs of those two facts proceed by uh, transfinite recursion along the structure of the Borel set in question. So that means that if we take ATR as the base theory, it will not be possible to distinguish those two proofs because the axioms used in those proofs are already implied by the base theory. Without ATR though, things get a little bit difficult uh, and uh, with uh, co-authors uh, Svarov, Flood, and Solomon, uh, we've shown that ATR is actually necessary in order to, in, in order for Borel sets to be well behaved in the sense that every Borel set actually has some uh, element that's either in it or out of it. So the way that we solve this puzzle uh, a little bit later. So this, um, this, this paper uh, that I'm referring to here is submitted, but it, it's actually the first one and it's several years old at this point, but just uh, takes a long time to, to write and so on. But uh, the, the, the way that we proposed to get around this problem came in, in a later paper that's, that's published just recently, which is to say, okay, we do need ATR in general in order to guarantee that an arbitrarily described Borel set has uh, elements that are in it and elements that are out of it. But what if we actually just changed our concept of what a Borel set uh, of, of what a Borel set is to include that condition as part of, of, of what it means to be Borel? So we can we can make all of these trees that describe oh we're going to put together the sets in this way. But if we put together sets in a way that's so complicated that given just the, the small number of uh, sets that may exist uh, in, in, you know, that are guaranteed to exist in some particular axiom system, if we, if, we, if, we, if we set up the Borel set in a way that it's so complicated that some uh, elements are just not gonna be either in or out of that set, then we're just not gonna call that a Borel set anymore. So when we look at statements such as every Borel set is measurable or every Borel set has the property of fair, then we can make those statements meaningful using a much weaker base theory than ATR by saying that those statements are only going to apply to sets that are built like Borel sets and for which it just happens to be the case that the, all of the membership facts are known. All right, so by, by making this definition, we are able to lower the complexity of the base theory. And uh, for, if there's any experts in the audience, I've written the base theory that I'm using for the rest of the talk, but you don't need to know oh, what this is if, uh, in order to, to follow what's happening. <clears throat> All right. 
So we end up with these two statements. Uh, CDM stands for completely determined measurable and CDPB stands for completely determined property affair. And these are the two axioms that are used in the two different proofs of the no Borel strategy for the prisoner hat problem. And now we want to, using this weaker base theory, uh, say something about the relative strength of these two theorems. All right, so here's, here's a slide with a bunch of results, just giving kind of a picture of what is known about not only the two uh, that I, uh, not, not only these two results, uh, CDPB and CDM uh, that I mentioned, but I'll, I'll also say some words about uh, some other theorems that are, are roughly in this space. So <clears throat> the, so the first thing that I want to point out in this diagram is that, remember this uh, arithmetic transfinite recursion. We know that this, this is a pretty strong axiom that's able to prove both that Borel sets have property of fair and that Borel sets are measurable. So uh, in, in two papers, uh, one with Astor, Safaro, Montalban, and Solomon, and then another one that, that I did following up, but using basically the same methods. We showed not only does ATR imply both of these two properties, but in fact, both of them are strictly weaker than ATR. So another way of saying this is to say that ATR, which essentially says you are allowed to produce objects by doing transfinite recursion along the construction of a Borel set, that's a strictly more powerful axiom than just saying hey, the Borel set has a property of bear, or hey, the Borel set is measurable. It's also known, and this, this uh, is, uh, uh, I, I, don't, I don't have an attribution for this result because it, it just uh, follows from some uh, facts that are known from, from the theory of higher randomness, that neither one of these principles implies the other one. We have seen proofs both from every Borel set as the property of bear to no Borel solution to the prisoner hat, and every Borel set is measurable to no Borel solution to the prisoner hat. And because these two don't imply each other, it must be that both of these implications are strict, right? Because if either of these were, if, if let's say these two were equivalent, then uh, we would have uh, CDPB implying CDM, which, which we know it doesn't. So we have kind of an interesting situation here. We have this theorem that the prisoner hat problem has no solution, no Borel solution, excuse me. And we have two different proofs of it. But if we believe Friedman's quote that when a theorem is proved from the right axioms, then the theorem proves the axioms back. If we believe that quote, then that means that we actually haven't exactly found what is the right axiom to prove that there's no Borel solution to prisoner hat yet. Because we've proved it from this axiom, and we've proved it from this axiom, but both of them are too strong. This uh, principle cannot prove either one of those back. Another thing that we, uh, that we would wanna consider in this context is we wanna know that this theorem, no Borel solution to, <clears throat> to prisoner hat, is actually strictly stronger than the base theory that we're using. Because if our hope is to evaluate the strength of this theorem, uh, then it's important that it not be already implied by the base theory, because then we're not uh, <clears throat> able to compare it to anything. So in some work with Tausner and, and uh, Weishardt, we showed also that the statement, there's no Borel solution to the prisoner hat is strictly stronger than whatever this base theory is. We, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry, I've got kind of a fro frog in my throat here. <clears throat> We've also considered uh, another couple of theorems involving Borel sets. And two that I wanna point out to you are the Borel-Dual-Ramsey theorem for three partitions 
and uh, <clears throat> if you know what that is, uh, great. Uh, if you don't, it's just some other theorem involving Borel sets. Uh, this, this theorem uh, on the right is more understandable uh, from its statement. Uh, so there is a Borel regular, a Borel three regular, so every um, vertex has three edges coming out of it, a bipartite graph that has no Borel two coloring. So in all three of these cases, the fact that we're looking for Borel objects is uh, the reason why we can't find them. So uh, just, as an, there's, just as there's an axiom of choice uh, solution to the, uh, or strategy for the prisoner hat problem. So using the axiom of choice, you can always find a two coloring for a bipartite graph. Um, but this theorem is saying that you can find a pretty nice graph that has no Borel two coloring. Okay, so uh, in, that, uh, same, in that same paper, we've shown that all three of these are at least weaker than this base theory. So this base theory uh, could be used in order to try to draw distinctions among them. And then this borel dual ramsey theorem, uh, it turns out, uh, also follows from the fact that every Borel set has the property of Bayer. All right, so this is basically just uh, a picture of uh, of some highlights of, of what's known so far. Uh, but this, this exploration is, is really just beginning. And so I expect that we are going to get a lot more, uh, a lot more filled out in this area in the future. So I wanna close up uh, with, some, with some details for people who may know a little bit more about reverse mathematics uh, and uh, higher randomness and so on. So without giving too many definitions, now I'll just give some, just some more remarks about what's in that picture. So considering first this implication between uh, ATR and every Borel set has the property of fair, a Nice fact about the, this theorem, every Borel set has the property of Bayer, is that at least in omega models of this theorem, for every x in the omega model, there has to be a, a delta 1, 1 x generic element also in the omega model. So this means that this theorem of every Borel set has the property of Bayer has a kind of thematic content where it's uh, basically saying that in any omega model where this is true, you can in some sense close under the operation of taking a delta one one generic. And a similar thing is true for the statement that every completely determined Borel set is measurable. So in any omega model of CDM, that omega model is in some sense closed under taking delta one one randoms. These two statements are also related to the way in which the separation, the separations here are proved. So the fact that we know that these uh, implications are both strict uh, can be witnessed by making a, uh, essentially a model. So we, we build a certain model of every Borel set has the property of Bayer. And the way that that model uh, figures out the witnesses to every Borel set has the property of Bayer is that the model just takes some like very generic elements and kind of pulls them and says, hey, are you in the set or out of the set? Are you in the set or out of the set? And based on the results of the poll, uh, one is able to figure out where the set is meager and where the set is co-meager and use that to uh, come up with the witnesses to the property of Bayer instead of recursing on the structure of the set directly. And you do a similar thing in the measurable case, taking a bunch of super random elements and just polling them about whether they're in or out of the set in order to figure out where the set has large measure and where the set has small measure. And then, uh, so those are, those are the remarks about these two directions. Uh, and then finally, I'll finish with some remarks about these directions. So uh, as I've mentioned before, using the axiom of choice, the prisoners have a winning strategy. Using the axiom of choice, every bipartite graph does have a two coloring. 
And if you remove the Borel condition from the dual Ramsey theorem and just, you know, uh, just, just remove it and don't put any other niceness condition in its place, then that theorem becomes false, but it's, uh, you need to use the axiom of choice in, in order to, to show its, its falseness. So the way that we prove those separations is we take a look at what happens in hype, which is the smallest model of, of our base theory. And we construct what hype thinks is a completely determined Borel well ordering of the reals. Now, there is no Borel well ordering of the reals, but hype is such an impoverished model that it can't prove that. And in fact, in, in hype, it, it's false. So, so we, we construct a, a code for a, a Borel set. It's very badly behaved. It's actually not even well-founded in the real world, but hype believes that it's well-founded and hype believes that it's giving a Borel well ordering of the reals. Well, once we have a Borel well ordering of the reals, that actually allows us to carry out choice constructions. So we essentially take the same classical proofs that show uh, that, that show uh, how, to, how to solve these various problems using the axiom of choice. And we uh, trick hype into thinking that those classical proofs are actually being carried out in a Borel way. All right, so that uh, is the end of my talk and I've put some references for some of the papers that I have mentioned in it. And thank you very much. It's been a, a pleasure to be here. And uh, yeah, if you have any questions, please ask. Thanks a lot, Linda, for the very nice talk. Um, already see raised hand. So. Yep. Yeah. So, so I have a question. Um, so thank you, thank you for the very nice talk. Um, so I suppose to talk about Borel sets in second order arithmetic, Borel sets are always being represented via Borel codes. Um, so, I mean, would it make sense, because in, in naively a Borel set's a third order concept, right? It's a, a set of reals, so a set of set of numbers. So. Would it be interesting to look at it in the context of third order arithmetic instead? I think I think it would. Yes, and that's that's not something that I've ever done done much of. I would be interested to see what happens there, and but I would also make what what I would consider as kind of a plug for the the second order arithmetic way of doing it, which is so as a computability theorist, uh, a thing that really interests me is how most uh, how much of our thinking is is algorithmic and when we think we're sort of thinking in terms of maybe natural numbers maybe infinite sequences of natural numbers but once we get to sets you know i don't know how to hold it anymore and, and think about it in my sort of constructive computability way so i know that i feel like when i think about borel sets i am thinking about them in terms of these these, these codes instead of like their actual objects. So that's one reason why I think that it is interesting to think about them in second order arithmetic. Although the third order case uh, questions would also be interesting. And we have a question by uh, um, uh, Andre next. Hi, thanks. No, it's more of a follow up to uh, Alex's question. Um, are you, uh, maybe you're familiar with this. Uh, let me walk this way. Okay, so uh, Sam Sanders and Doug Norman have been exploring uh, reverse mathematics that's uh, coding free where such higher order objects just appear without any coding. So that might be an interesting line to, uh, to follow. I can send you references. And if you just uh, look up some Sam Sanders or Doug Norman, you'll find them, it's easy to find. Thank you. Um, I'll jump in with, with a question next. Then, um, for the sort of, do, do you have have any candidates for what might be sort of theorems that look natural to the sort of um, ordinary mathematicians that could be um, 
exactly as hard as as either of um, CDM or um, CD Pin. It's a it's a slightly harder question because oftentimes the the so you could say you know, every Borel set has such and such a property, every Borel set has such other property, where the property is one that a measurable set has. Typically the way that typically if something is proved about a Borel set because of the fact that the Borel set is measurable then typically the way that the theorem will be stated is every measurable set has such and such a property. And then, and then you can say, oh, well, you know, Borel sets are an example of that. So these theorems that are somehow about Borel sets specifically are uh, in, at least in what I've looked around and seen so far, maybe a little less common in the wild. So I don't have a specific example in mind of that, although I definitely have my eye out for it. A, a sort of question also going into how natural these, these principles are beyond their sort of obvious use in, in itself. Um, you have these character, you have these properties of what their, oh, 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 their oh, oh, omega models must do. Is there any chance of getting a reversal there? So like is is having delta one one generics enough to be in omega model? Is there, is there anything that one can add to that to make that, that work? This, this is a question that I definitely want to answer, but have not yet. Those are questions. Can go to the participant window and there should be a raise hand button there. Um, Jean. Yes, uh, thanks for the very nice talk. Um, I'm actually somehow a beginner in that kind of uh, reverse mathematics. And um, well, it's in not quite true. Uh, I mean, I was interested in it, but that was decades ago. I forgot most about it. And uh, the vague thing I was remembering from that age was that we had those five, big five systems. And the most expressive of all those was pi 1, 1 CA0, if I remember well. And I had the impression that already the weakest system you have uh, even weaker than that, L omega 1 omega CA0 is much more expressive than pi 1 CA0. Is that right? So uh, this, this L omega 1 omega CA0, uh, I don't know if there would have been another principle that had that name in the past, but the, as I know it, it's only defined pretty recently. And it is a principle that is uh, weaker not only than pi 1 1 CA, but also than ATR. Oh, right. Okay. Thanks. And then once more to Alex. Yeah, so sorry for hogging the questions. I just wanted to check something for my understanding. So your arguments at the beginning about there is no Burrell strategy for this prisoner hat game. So they also show the necessity of the axiom of choice um, for, for, for having a, a winning strategy for um, for, for, for the prisoners, right? Because if you if you have all sets immeasurable or something like that, then then uh, then you don't have that strategy. Is that is that right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Well, actually, may, no. I, I should I should caveat that that slightly. Um, It shows that the axiom of choice was, was really used, um, but I don't have uh, like, just, may, may, maybe, maybe you could imagine a world, and, and I'm, sure that, I'm sure that somebody knows the answer to this, uh, but I don't, you, maybe you could imagine a, you know, a, a model of, of ZF where the axiom of choice fails, but um, somehow the, you know, the, the prisoners still managed to have a strategy that works. 
that, that, they, that they got by by some other way, right? So, so, I, so, I, so I, I don't know if the prisoners having a strategy proves the axiom of choice, but something is needed beyond Baralmas. Oh, you muted. Yeah, so it was also just that there are models in which the axiom of choice fails in which the prisoners do not have a strategy. Right? There are models in which the axiom of choice fails in which the prisoners do not have a winning strategy. So, yeah, good, thanks. In the, in the sort of context of expecting strategies to be Borel, um, it, it seems that sort of if you're if you're sort of viewing this as a competition between the prisoners and the said sadistic warden, um, sort of more or less sort of in the, the sort of proof that the prisoners don't have a um, Borel winning strategy could in itself be, be, be seen as sort of how the warden constructs the particular coloring that, that makes them fail. Um, you, would, you would then have sort of those, those kind of models where that construction fails because, well, the sort of theorem that you said you showed us doesn't go through, and then you would know that's in L. Oh, omega one, omega CA, and so on. You 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 can have these models. Um, is there sort of anything clear to state about sort of how that game looks like in these models? I'm sorry. I seem to be asking weird questions. Yeah, I'd have to think about that. Okay, we have another couple of minutes in case that there's anyone who hasn't dared to ask their question yet or who got inspired to ask one in the meantime. I see no further raised hands, so I suggest that we uh, thank Linda for her for a very nice talk. And, and then uh, close this session.